The Second Vatican Council was a plotter's get-together. A robber council, a hijacking, a revolution in the church, certainly to be called illegitimate and void by future Catholic popes. This much became clear to the founder of the Fraternal Society of St. Pius X, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. The introduction of the new mass, religious ecumenism, and an insistence upon the separation of church and state, even in Catholic countries, these and other Masonic innovations made up the core of the new conciliar church, as termed in private by Cardinal Benelli. Although it is true that Archbishop Lefebvre signed the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council, he quickly repented of it, and for nearly 30 years did all he could in both public and private to make the heretical spirit of the Council known to Roman authorities. In 1986, with the first Vatican-sponsored interreligious prayer meeting at Assisi, Lefebvre realized that the authorities were complicit. Rome had erected a new church founded on the ideals of the Reformation and the Revolution. Sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, everything that's wonderful is what I feel when we're together, brighter than a lucky penny. When you're near the rain goes, disappears, dear, and I feel so fine just to know that you are mine. My life is sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, that's how Everything that's wonderful is sure to come your way When you're in love to stay In 1988, Marcel Lefebvre made a formal act of allegiance to eternal Rome and consecrated four bishops to the Catholic Church. This act was deemed schismatic by the new conciliar church of Vatican II. The Archbishop was not alone in his heroic and defiant act. Bishop Antonio de Castro-Meyer of Campos, Brazil, joined him, saying that it would have been a mortal sin for him not to have been there. Just days after the consecrations, Archbishop Lefebvre wrote to Cardinal Gantin, Prefect of the Congregation of Bishops, explaining his actions. He says, The Catholic faithful have a strict right to know that the priests to whom they have recourse are not in communion with a counterfeit church, which is evolutionary, Pentecostalist, and syncretist. Compare this with the position of the leaders of the SSPX in 2012. Ultimately, from the modern spirit of an unbalanced desire for information and an insistence on a right to know, souls will be led away from Christ's peace. Non-SSPX members, for example the laity, do not have a strict right to be kept informed about the internal affairs of the SSPX, which is a religious congregation. Having faithfully passed on what he had received, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre now reflected on the relationship between Catholic doctrine and the doctrine of the new church, codified in 1988 in the new Code of Canon Law. He saw with absolute certainty that interpreting the Council in the light of tradition was an impossible feat. Before his death on March 25, 1991, 
Marcel Lefebvre laid down the conditions upon which any future negotiations with Rome could be built. Rome would now have to make an act of faith. Rome would have to return to the church. Till that day, the SSPX and all Catholics everywhere were in survival mode. Why can't we work out our differences? Why can't we work things out? Why can't we all just get along? In 1997, the GREC was formed. The members of GREC, or the Group for Reflection Among Catholics, seek to re-establish connections between the SSPX and the new conciliar church by setting aside issues of doctrine and engaging in dialogue without anger. GREC is a novice Ordo think tank founded by Gilbert Perrault, former ambassador of France to Rome, and Father Michel Lelon a fervent defender of interreligious dialogue as promoted by Vatican II. The goal of Grec, stated in the Charter, written by Perrault, is to interpret Vatican II in the light of tradition, according to the formula John Paul II gave to Archbishop Lefebvre in 1978. This formula is also known as the hermeneutic of continuity of Benedict XVI, or better still, as the hermeneutic of rupture, according to Archbishop Lefebvre. Another founder of Grec was SSPX spokesman and editor of the SSPX website, Dici.org, Father Alain Laurent. Father Laurent obtained permission from Bishop Fillet, Superior General of the SSPX, to participate in Grec's dialogue for unnecessary reconciliation. He kept Bishop Fillet well informed of the progress of the dialogue. The Fraternity of St. Peter, formed with Rome's approval by priests who abandoned Archbishop Lefebvre at the time of the consecrations in 1988, also took part in the dialogue. It was represented by Father Ribetin, the Fraternity of St. Peter, Superior of France. Later, the head of the Institute of Christ the King joined the dialogue as well. The dialogue focused on a return of the SSPX to full communion. For example, Michel Lelong writes... One can hope that these meetings will lead to an agreement without delay. But the SSPX must understand that if it has much to offer to Rome, it also has much to receive from it. It must therefore stop rejecting Vatican II outright and accept the guiding principles and in interpreting them as proposed by the Holy Father today. Why the insistence on reconciliation? Had Rome made an act of faith? No, but that didn't matter. The leaders of the SSPX laid down new conditions. Rather than the act of faith that their founder had insisted be a prerequisite to all talks, they asked instead that the excommunications be lifted and the Latin Mass freed for all priests to say. This, the members of Grec agreed in 2000, would be a sign of good faith on the part of conciliar Rome. A sign of good faith, maybe. An act of faith? Hardly. Instead, an act of faith in Vatican II would be demonstrated in 2012 by Benedict XVI at a CC3, at which even an atheist representative would participate this time. Atheists, by the way, don't believe in God. The evils of false ecumenism don't seem to matter so much these days as the Father Laurent run SSPX website, Dici, made almost no mention of the communicatio in Sacris. Benedict was traditional, remember? He had issued the motu proprio of 2007, freeing up the Latin Mass. He had followed it up in 2009 with the lifting of the excommunications of the four bishops. Yes, 2009 was meant to be a big year for tradition. Benedict and Bishop Flay were on the brink of a brilliant photo op that would rival all those of John Paul II in the hordes of smiling babies. Hopes were nursed in the breast of many that maybe finally, at last, 
a traditional bishop would be elevated to the curia. Traditionalist media outlets like Michael Matt's The Remnant and John Venary's Catholic Family News were falling all over themselves to make sense of all this tradition coming out of Rome. What could it mean? Yes, that year all was on course for the reconciliation Greg had longed for. The reconciliation now deemed prudent. The reconciliation that Father Rostand, District Superior of the U.S., would call an act of justice as though being recognized and approved of by betrayers of our Lord was something one wanted. The reconciliation that Archbishop Lefebvre had called in 1988 Operation Suicide. Yes, everything seemed to be running smoothly ahead. Everything that is until... Between two and three hundred thousand Jews perished in uh, Nazi concentration camps, but not one of them by gassing in a gas chamber. Suddenly, Benedict XVI was afraid to touch the SSPX with a ten-foot pool. His elder brothers were quite upset that the lie of the Holocaust should be exposed so flagrantly by a Catholic bishop. After all, what was the conciliar church if not a conciliatory church? Bishop Fillet had expressed desire to move Bishop Williamson to the sidelines in 1999 just two years after Greg's formation. Bishop Williamson called uranium a ticking time bomb and much worse by Father Pfluger and other SSPX leaders would not be removed from his position as rector at the SSPX seminary in America until 2003. Was he given another top position in the SSPX? No. He was transferred all the way to Argentina in the southern hemisphere of the globe between Chile and Uruguay. Truth has a way of outing itself no matter where it is. And so one may say that it was a fortuitous event when on German soil for a Swedish television production, Bishop Williamson made his candid remarks about the Holocaust. Remarks that were perceived by the conciliar church as an attack on its elder brothers. This video will not get into the fact that Williamson's remarks are closer to the truth than any you might find coming from mainstream media sources. You may delve into that one on your own. Instead, let us just look at the response of Benedict XVI. Astonishingly, or perhaps not, he says that if he had known Williamson's views on the Shoah, he never would have lifted his excommunication. But, unfortunately, none of us went on the internet to find out what sort of person we were dealing with. Really, had Benedict been uninformed? As prefect of the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith from 1981 to 2005, had he not been the number one middleman for the SSPX in Rome? Had he not commented in written letters to Archbishop Lefebvre on numerous sermons preached by society priests from pulpits all over the world? And now was he pleading ignorance in the face of Jewish wrath? It was disingenuous at best, dissembling at worst. But none of this came as any surprise to those who had been paying attention. If the society grows corrupt, then a deal, a corrupt deal is easy. If Rome converts, then a deal is also easy, there's, there's no problem though. If Rome gets back, if the Romans re-understand and get back to the true religion, then the society is their best friend and they've got no more problem with the society. And it's child's play to reintegrate the society into the structures of Rome. But so long as Rome is with the new religion and the society stays with the old, there can only be war between the old religion and the new religion. So either Rome abandons the new religion or the society abandons the old religion. That's what's got to happen before there can be any agreement. We have our great men and women, and we have some flannel mouth fools too. We all want to live in a better world. We all want to have more. But there's no mystery about what we have or how to lose it. Let's look straight into this one. Let's talk about how to lose what we have and what that would mean to you. In March 2012, 
Bishop Fillet wrote in the Society's internal publication, Cor Unum, that Rome's movement towards tradition in recent years demands of us a new position in relation to the official church. This assertion by the Superior General prompted a response by the other three bishops of the SSPX, who wrote to Bishop Fillet on April 7, 2012. Your Excellency, Fathers, take care. You want to lead the society to a point where it will no longer be able to turn back to a profound division of no return, and, if you end up to such an agreement, it will be with powerful destroying influences who will not keep it. If up until now the bishops of the society have protected it, it is precisely because Monsignor Lefebvre refused a practical agreement. Since the situation has not changed substantially, since the condition prescribed by the chapter of 2006 was by no means carried out, which was a doctrinal change in Rome which would permit practical agreement, at least listen to your founder. It was right 25 years ago. It is right still today. On his behalf, we entreat you, do not engage the society in a purely practical agreement. Bishop Fillet, Father Fluger, and Father Naley were the first and second assistants responded one week later. You cannot know how much your attitude over the last few months, quite different for each of you, has been hard for us. It has prevented the Superior General from sharing with you these great concerns, which he would gladly have brought you into, had he not found himself faced with such a strong and passionate lack of understanding. How much he would have loved to be able to count on you on your advice to undergo this so delicate moment in our history. It is a great trial, perhaps the greatest of all 18 years of his being superior. Our venerable founder gave to the society bishops a task and precise duties. He made clear that the principle of unity in our society is the superior general. But for a certain time now, you have been trying, each one of you in his own way, to impose on him your point of view even in the form of threats, and even in public. This dialectic between the truth and the faith on the one side and authority on the other is contrary to the spirit of the priesthood. He might at least have hoped that you were trying to understand the arguments driving him to act as he had acted these last few years in accordance with the will of divine providence. What did this mean? Had the three bishops been remiss in showing their superior general the love? Or had Bishop Fillet simply changed the course of the ship and accused his shipmates of lacking a supernatural spirit and realism? Actually, that was it precisely. Your collective letter suffers from two faults with regard to the reality of the church. It is lacking both in supernatural spirit and in realism. Bishop Williamson, Bishop Tissier, and Bishop de Galaretta lacking in realism, or rather lacking in Greek sensibilities. One day after responding to the three bishops, Bishop Fillet sent a doctrinal preamble to Rome, which outlined all that he was willing to do in order to be officially recognized by the conciliar church. Among the many weak stances put forward in the preamble is this one. The affirmations of the Second Vatican Council and of the later Pontifical Magisterium relating to the relationship between the Church and the non-Catholic Christian confessions, as well as the social duty of religion and the right to religious liberty, whose formulation is with difficulty reconcilable with prior doctrinal affirmations from the Magisterium, must be understood in the light of the whole, uninterrupted tradition, in a manner coherent with the truths previously taught by the magisterium of the church without accepting any interpretation of these affirmations whatsoever that would expose Catholic doctrine to opposition or rupture with tradition and with the magisterium. Sounds like a victory for Grec. What would Archbishop Lefebvre have to say about Vatican II's stance on religious liberty? Let's open religious liberty questioned and find out. On the first page of the introduction, the question is posed. Can the conciliar declaration on religious liberty, dignitatis humanae, be reconciled with the traditional doctrine of the church? The answer is no. The words of Archbishop Lefebvre are clear. I do not believe that the declarations of the Council on liberty of conscience, liberty of thought, and liberty of religion can be compatible with the popes taught in the past. Therefore, we have to choose. 
Either we choose what the popes have taught for centuries and we choose the church, or we choose what was said by the council, but we cannot choose both at the same time since they are contradictory. Have the leaders of the SSPX adopted a contradictory position? Yes. But that's not all it's done. Since 2012, it has expelled, locked its doors on, silenced, cut off, or charged with leaving every priest who has voiced any concern whatsoever over this change of course. These priests include Father Gerard, Father Chazelle, Father Pfeiffer, Father Liviatus, Father Hugo, Father Voigt, Father Ringrose, Father Arizaga, Father Ortiz, Father Ruiz, Father Riolt, Father Trincado, Father Thomas Aquinas, Father Zabi, Father Cardoza, as well as the Carmelite nuns of Germany and of course Bishop Williamson, the only one of the three bishops to still be putting up a fight, and others who prefer to be unnamed for the moment. The question, however, is not how could the leaders of the SSPX cast so many good priests, but rather, why are there not more priests speaking out? The day that the SSPX abandons the spirit and rules of its founder, it will be lost. Has that day come? Since the SSPX has abandoned the spirit, is it time for us to abandon the SSPX? Consider for a moment, why would Bishop Filet want a deal so badly? Why is the SSPX considered to be outside the church, but Pope Francis has no problem calling Muslims his brothers on Good Friday? Our Lady of Fatima insists that Russia be consecrated. The SSPX used to insist that this had not yet happened. Does it still do so today? Will it continue to do so after being welcomed into the fold of the new conciliar church? These questions and many more are yours to ask. Don't let anyone tell you that you shouldn't be troubled. Watch and pray, says our Lord.